Hello and welcome. We're delighted to introduce you to the Hans W. Lawald Center. Along with a group of colleagues from the Institute for Psychoanalytic Training and Research in New York City and the Western New England Institute in New Haven, we've created a center inspired by Lowald seminal thinking and its sweeping potentials for contemporary practice. Among the challenges facing 21st century psychoanalysis is the task of integrating our plethora of theoretical schools rather than creating yet another one. We consider Hans Lowald a pioneer in this endeavor. The mission of the Lowald Center is to build creatively on Lowald's contributions by bringing a broad array of analysts into meaningful contact and dialogue with the integrative spirit of his thinking. Toward that end, we invite you to join us for our inaugural conference on April 30th, 2022, exploring Lowald's contributions as a quiet revolutionary, creative synthesizer, and inspiration for 21st century psychoanalysis. In this brief video, you'll hear from our two keynote speakers, Nancy Chattero and Jonathan Lear, as well as from members of the center, candidates and senior analysts alike, about their personal experience of Lowald and his influence on them. Enjoy. There was a collection of his essays on sale and I bought it and I just went home and started reading them uh, called Papers in Psychoanalysis. And literally I had that feeling of, I can't believe what I'm reading. Mm. Um, it was so overwhelmingly beautiful. I just remember that we read a, book, a chapter uh, an essay called Internalization, Separation, Mourning, and the Superego. And I remember a friend of mine who was in the seminar running up to me and saying, Nancy, look, do you see that he says that the greatest polarity in human existence is between separation and connection and oneness? He's talking about the meaning of life. Um, I actually had a photograph. It's a very smiling photograph and extremely twinkly in the eyes. And I found that this is the side of him that is playful, that has himself retained a certain amount of certainly childlike playfulness, particularly with words. So Hans was, um, you know, he began as a philosopher. He was what we would now call a graduate student in philosophy in Germany. There's this tremendous wealth of thinking about the nature of the human psyche in the ancient Greek philosophical world. And I think it's an artifact of 19th century science and then um, 19th and 20th century professionalisms, the way the uh, medical profession took shape as a profession, um, that all of this has been, I mean, it's easily available, but it's all cut off. Psychoanalysis have become highly medicalized here. Um, and in a lot of ways was beginning to become caricatured and Lowald really had a way of holding on to our old and important Freudian roots um, at their core, but also being able to synthesize what was now becoming also important. That is in psychoanalysis, there's sort of a, the old fashioned, you know, Freud, the analyst the, as the doctor, the, the expert, the treater, then there was a move towards something that was very um, fused. Every, you know, everything is co-constructed. Everything is being like our, our interview here is being created together. And Lowald has a way of formulating a sense of seeing the other. I don't know how else to put it. It's his analytic stance. What I appreciate, you know, there's a lot of writing now um, that's addressing cultural issues, race, diversity, gender, what have you, um, is that you can think um, from like a Lewaldian lens, I guess, if you will, um, that considers the person's culture and the external factors in their life without compromising, and this is the important part, I think, without compromising the importance of their inner world. What he did was, in my mind, change dramatic aspects of psychoanalytic thinking. But he always managed to link it to Freud. He would find some relevant passage in Freud where he could link 
what his ideas were. He says that Freud was a living presence for him. Those are the words he used. But his kind of Freudian was to use all of his imagination and all of his thinking and all of his capabilities to grow from Freud. And that often meant, you know, disagreeing with Freud. He really had an object relations position. So he knew about the power and influence, not only of the mother, the parents, the society, the culture. He included all of that, which made it enormously different from Freud and made it very appealing to me. At one point in the waning of the Oedipus complex, he says, you know, we didn't choose our own parents, but we have to, part of the, the, the overcoming or the waning of the Oedipus complex is coming to live our lives as if we did choose them. I think he says something along the lines of um, the Oedipus complex rears its head again. And in this revisiting, in this constant um, struggle to, to master the Oedipus complex throughout one's, uh, one's life, um, one has an opportunity in a way, I see it that way, to redefine oneself. But I also take it to to be a very uh, beautiful statement on, um, on how gen generations uh, move forward in psychoanalysis, uh, not, so, not just by killing the parents, not just by killing the authority, by, by both internalizing this authority and making something new. He's very unafraid of um, the depths of the human mind and he is very unpathologizing. In fact, one of the things that I find, I had supervision with him and there's uh, what's called the narcissistic phase of development, which is a very early sense now, you know, I'm sure with... Um, Trump and so on, <laughs> there's a lot of um, attention to narcissism and, you know, you can become very moralistic. In supervision, he was extremely interested in those early phases of development, so that, um, and unafraid. Sometimes he worked with di really difficult patients that didn't, where really there didn't seem to be progress, rather than what was typical of analysts at the time to say the pathology is so extreme for this patient that analysis isn't going to work. He didn't say that. What he said was, you know, I don't think I'm a good fit for you as an analyst. It seems to me such a different way of responding than in some way saying to the patient, you know what, you're too sick. Um, you know, there's a kindness and caringness. So afterwards, I was actually um, amazed at how much um, I encountered in supervising other people and also in listening to other people talk clinically, how negative they were about narcissism. I mean, I had <laughs> sort of grown with hands to feel that this is, you know, the... Uh, a, a garden of creativity, actually. I think what helped me the most in Lowell is really the notion of, um, of love, actually, in, in therapeutic action. But at some point, he says in one of his essays that um, the love of truth is no less a passion than... Um, love in other places just because its object happens to be truth. He did have to make a point about an objectivity, the essence of which is love and respect. You know, we're not distant scientists. But to be a love of truth, it's got to be a kind of disciplined passion. And it's a developmental perspective that, you know, he does, lots of analysts have likened this to mother-child or parent-child. But, you know, just like you don't want a mother who can't differentiate herself from the child, you know, and we're, you know, you want somebody who's both totally involved and totally separate and seeing the, the real subjective 
selfness of the other. In training, we begin and uh, we want to interpret. We want to know how to interpret. Uh, it's, it makes us feel that we're doing our work, you know. Um, but it's, it resonated very powerfully for me in my training, thinking that the essence of insight too uh, cannot exist solely in interpretation because interpretation cannot resonate its power without being embedded in an experience of being loved. An objectivity and neutrality, the essence of which is love and respect for the individual and for individual development. Empathic objectivity. Well, there's a way in which he's so precise about the, what the analytic stance is in the relation to the patient, but he doesn't feel he has to fight other people to make his point in that way. He said to me, and it was pretty much the last thing he said to me, was that he hoped that there would never be any Lowaldians. Lowald was terribly keen on not having a school. He was not at all political. He was against political divisiveness. What Hans Lowald's life was, as I understand it, was a life of freedom. And that meant there's nobody you could, um, you know, slavishly follow. He's an integrator. He's a synthesizer. He's a, he's a, he's broader than one school. Well, I think Lo, what think what Lowell is great at is helping connect these different schools. Um, I mean, the people on this project actually all. Um, I think have varying stripes in terms of how they think. My hope for the project is that doing it in an independent way um, outside of an institute um, will help promote a certain freedom of thinking. I want there to be change in the way psychoanalysts think. That's a battle. <laughs> and I think with Low some of Lowell's ideas, it might help in that direction as well. But I would like to see more unity that what really is effective should remain, what's not, and what's empirically wrong should be eliminated. So what interests me is to be able to have a larger platform where both the positive and the negative aspects or the limiting aspects of the theory can be altered. That's possible in a, in a center. My hope is for us to really have a place to really help develop um, I guess new and innovative ideas, the way in which Lowell himself really did. As you have just seen and heard, Hans Lowell has deeply affected generations of analysts through his integrative thinking and broad vision, his depiction of life as an interplay of separation and connection, and his understanding of neutrality as an expression of the analyst's love and respect for the patient's individuality. We hope you have found this brief video informative and stimulating. If you'd like to learn more about Hans Lowold and the Hans Lowold Center, please visit our website at www.lowoldcenter.org. And please join us for the Center's inaugural conference, which will take place next spring on April 30th, 2022.